I'll go ahead and and I'll you know introduce everyone and say hello. I've I've said hello gradually if people as people have come in, but hello, thanks for joining us this morning at eleven o'clock Eastern for this this webinar. Uh, this webinar with Esri Canada and Defining Moments Canada. Uh, speaking of on, on GIS Day about storytelling with our GIS technology, uh, I'm Louis Lebel. I'm the digital content manager at Defining Moments Canada. Um, with me, we have Amanda Merpa, who will be speaking and explaining a bit what Defining Moments Canada is in a bit, and Jean Tong, who is the K-12 Education Manager at Esri Canada. So we'll be taking turns speaking about kind of who we are, what we do, what our organizations do, uh, what, how we tell stories, and how we use uh, GIS technology. So I'll start by throwing to... Amanda, who I've not introduced at all. I've said who I am in my title. I said who Jean is in her title. And I just said Amanda as well. So I think I'll, I'll let you take over this part. And you you know yourself best. So tell us in two words or less who you are or more. <laughs> oh, my gosh. It's like one of those icebreaker exercises. Um, My name is Amanda Murpa. Hi, everybody. I am the project coordinator for the Bryce at 100 project at Defining Moments Canada. Um. I also have almost a decade of classroom teaching experience in Ontario. I'm based in Toronto and originally from Ottawa, um, teaching in English and French immersion programs, um, mostly through uh, grades grades three to eight, uh, social studies, so history, geography, English, core French, um, those sorts of those sorts of classes, uh, and I've I'm super excited to be here today. Uh, I'm going to just explain a bit about who DMC is, what Defining Moments Canada is, um, and then I'll pass it back to Louis to show some examples of of some of the story maps we've worked on and some of the projects that we've done, uh, and then I'll pop back on to talk a little bit from a teacher's perspective, some ideas for how you might use story maps in the classroom and what the value of them uh, might be. Uh, for you. So Defining Moments Canada, if you're not familiar with who we are, uh, we're a heritage organization based in Canada, uh, dedicated to commemorating definitional moments in our shared histories here. Uh, and we're, we're really focused on telling the micro histories often about macro historical moments, right? The Our first project was about the 1918 influenza pandemic that, that you might be familiar with, your students might be familiar with in passing. And we're really interested in telling, uh, telling micro stories about individuals and communities who experienced those moments and what those moments would have been like for them. Uh, we're a totally digital organization, so I'm sure at some point we will direct you to our website. Louis will show a lot of what's on our website. Um, everything can be accessed digitally and for free. Um, we're really focused on interdisciplinary methods to learn and engage um, in inquiry learning in your classroom. Um, and teachers and students are our main demographic, so we're really interested in bringing these tools and resources to you for your classrooms. Uh, as I said, our first project was about the 1918 influenza pandemic. Other projects uh, we've done have been uh, Juno Stories, VE Day 75, Insulin at 100, Hertzberg 50. Uh, we're currently working on a project about Nobel Canadians, um, All for Nine, which is a labor history project, uh, and Bryce at 100, which is the project I'm coordinating um, about the work of Dr. Peter Bryce. A lot of these projects have had story maps associated with them, and I'm actually going to pass back to Louis, who's going to show you some of the maps before we talk about how you might use them in your classroom. Perfect. Uh, thank you for introducing yourself and kind of what Defining Moments Canada does. I also am part of Defining Moments Canada, so that's, I'm glad you've done that introduction so now I can get a bit more into the matter. Uh, before I do, I want to point a couple of things out, just kind of webinar things. Uh, I think we've done so many in the last few years that maybe it becomes natural. And I just do want to clear things up, not clear things up, but uh, if you do have questions throughout the webinar, there is the Q&A uh, functionality where you can ask a question and I can answer them as we go. Uh, any questions also we can answer after at the end of the presentations that we have, we'll be glad to kind of do a Q&A section, uh, but do feel free to ask your question at any time and I'll table it and we'll talk about it later. Um, I just want to clear that up. I know 
webinars have become a bit of a, a thing that we're used to, but maybe sometimes we've forgotten or we haven't been one on one in a while, or we, maybe we don't know what the format of this one is. So I do, in the excitement to introduce Amanda and or have her introduce herself, uh, I forgot to mention that. So I did want to say that. Now, for myself, we're speaking of, of I want to show a few examples of story maps uh, from kind of a historical and a storytelling perspective. And then I'll throw back to Amanda again. Uh, to go through the pedagogical kind of uh, how teachers can use this and the kind of teaching aspect of it, the pedagogical aspect of it. Now, there's there's a lot of projects that Defining Moments Canada has done, and I, I have been part of many of them. Uh, the few that I want to talk about, I want to talk about two specific maps to show different types of story maps. Uh, we've done projects like VE Day 75 or Juno Stories, which focus on micro histories on the stories of, of people. Um, and a specific map that has to do with that that I would like to show, and I'll share my screen now, uh, is a map from our Insulin 100 project. Now, this is, is not a micro history in that we're not showing, you know, a small history of the average person. I guess, it, you know, if we, we talk about our VE Day map, we talk about the average uh, soldier and we see the life in the day of a soldier or a nurse or someone like that. I guess in a sense, this is the life in a day of an average person who discovered insulin. Uh, there's a very few of those. And the, the, the one we're talking about in this map is Frederick Banting. Now, this map covers his whole story. I'm going quick just to get back to the top here. It covers the story of Frederick Banting uh, through kind of this geographical perspective. We're seeing places that are important in his life. Uh, as you scroll down the story, the spots zoom in and zoom out and tell us exactly where it is. And this type of map is really interesting for our storytelling because what it does is it allows us to talk about the story of insulin through the story of one person, how Banting's story may have affected his discovering insulin, how Banting discovering insulin affected him. Uh, and we see that through his story. So in this one, we're using a story map. We're looking, you know, in this section, we're looking at the First World War. Uh, we're seeing where he was stationed. We're seeing photos in this map of letters of things that he he wrote as a, a doctor on the field, uh, things that really affected him. And as you're reading the story, the map shows you these kind of artifacts and these areas. Now, as because we're recording it through a webinar and I'm I'm loading all these things on my computer, it's a bit slow from, from your perspective as you're seeing it. But you see the map here and you see how he comes back to London afterwards. Uh, the, the map on top also allows you to have different sections of the story. We're talking about the discovery of insulin, which is the section I'm in now. Uh, we see artifacts and we see geographical locations of where things like this took place. Um, you know, of course, a lot of it took place in Toronto, in Connaught Laboratories, inside one building. So the map's not going to take us from Banting's desk, desk to her Best's desk to McLeod's desk, but instead tell us important spots on the map, where Banting is from, where his medical practice was. Uh, and we're seeing important artifacts through through the map as well. So it really is an immersive experience as you're going through it. And it allows us to tell the story of the discovery of insulin through one person, but with interactive discovery as you're going through it. Now, I think that's really interesting. And I'll, I'll stop sharing this one just so we see me again, because I, I want to talk about just the storytelling aspect. That's kind of my thing is of storytelling. I worked, you know, at the Haunted Walk for four years, and I worked as a tour guide for 10 years in many different places. And in storytelling, you want to be able to have the person listening to your story, engage in the story, relate to the story. And by having the map there, you know, you might have a student go, oh, I've been there or I'm from there. By having the artifact pop up, you have them interact with it. So it really allows the students to, to and I don't want to get too far into pedagogical things because that's what Amanda will do. But from a storytelling perspective, really allows people to engage with the story. Now, that's one type of map that we have where we're really diving into the story a large story like the discovery of insulin, uh, we're diving through it by looking at one person's experience with that. That's a similar thing that we have with the VE Day maps, where we're diving through the history of the Second World War by seeing different people's experience with it. Another type I want to show you, and this is another type, a map that we've actually just launched. Uh, this is for the All for Nine project, which is a labor history project that we're running right now and going into next year and the next. Um, 
Basically, we want to talk about labor movements from 1872 until now across Canada. 1872 is a really important date because that's the date of the nine hour movement, the push starting uh, in, in many places in Canada, but specifically in Hamilton for a nine hour workday. Uh, this led to major strikes and to eventual reforms throughout history in Canada. Now, we want to look in this map, and I actually, I said I was going to do something, and I haven't. I'm going to stop, share, and reshare. I want to share sound with this map. Uh, that's really important, because with this map, there's different functionalities that we've gone to use to really create this immersive experience. And one of these things is, as you're going through, we can play... We can play this kind of background sound, which is industrial sound. And this is, has to do with kind of the labor history that we have. So as you're discovering uh, and you're engaging with the story, you really have this immersive experience. What makes this map different from the other one that I talked about is this is a list of, and I'll, I'll have them all open here on the sides, but you see Canada and a list of where these different labor movements have happened throughout history and throughout Canada. So there's different ways to to kind of scroll through it. I can say, oh, I'm from, you know, I'm from Alberta. I want to go see this one. And you click on the spot and it takes you to Alberta nurses in 1988, a very important labor movement. There is a YouTube video that's embedded in it that allows you to engage with multimedia content as you're discovering the story. This story is fairly short, as you can see here, because the idea is we want to have kind of a list perspective of it. So the map is used differently. The storytelling is used differently than one where you tell the story of one person. This is we're telling different types of stories. Now, I clicked on Alberta. I'll stay there, but let's say I scroll down. Now, if we're going chronologically through the stories, this one takes me across the map. So I can choose to scroll down on the left-hand side here and look chronologically at all these different strikes in Canadian history, these different labor movements, or I can select that on the map myself and decide where I want to go afterwards. If I want to go geographically from Newfoundland to Cape Breton uh, and then go over to Quebec and different things. So this allows us to engage with the story in different ways, either chronologically, either geographically, in the way that kind of speaks to us. And it allows us to have storytelling, not necessarily of a person and how that affected the story, but here we're really going with the story and going through with the people there. So these are different examples. And, you know, I could be going through, we, we have story maps for all the projects and Amanda listed the projects that Defining Moments Canada has. And we have, you know, eight projects to date, we're doing more and story maps is something we want to integrate and to have in every single one of our projects, we work with Esri closely with every one of our projects to create these maps. Uh, so I could go project by project and show you all of these, but I just wanted to talk about two different types that we've re really utilized. And, and, you know, I talked about it from a storytelling perspective, why it's important, how we use it to tell the story. I do want to go back to Amanda because, you know, I'm, I'm digital content, I'm storyteller, that's what I know. Uh, Amanda is a former teacher. I'm a former student, uh, but I, I, I don't have the same expertise as Amanda to talk about kind of how we can use this in a classroom setting. So I'd like to throw back to you, Amanda, and then we'll talk to Jean afterwards. Jean, I know you're just chomping at the bit to get to speak about all the technical aspect. Uh, once we talk to Jean, we'll talk about the back end, how we create these, and she has a much more technical knowledge than I do. So I'll throw to Amanda for now, and Amanda, afterwards, you'll go right to Jean. Thanks, Louis. Um, I'm I'm super excited to chat a bit about the ideas that come up for me when I when I see Louis sharing these story maps and when I look at the other story maps we have available or thinking about the possibility of of supporting students and making their own in the classroom. Um, this is my first year out of the classroom in a really long time engaging in this position at Defining Moments Canada and this was super exciting in preparation for this webinar to think about like, ooh, if I had to do this in my classroom. So I'm hoping to share a bit today with you um, as a thought partner, which was one of my favorite ways to collaborate with colleagues when I was teaching in the classroom, just as a thought partner, some ideas that came up for me when I was looking through the story maps that we have to offer 
what might you think about if you were engaging with ones that are already made? So for example, the ones on our website that Louis has just um, showed you, um, and then some ideas for what you might do with your students if you wanted to support them in creating their own. Keeping in mind that I'm sure we have folks here across K to 12, um, teaching either, you know, in the elementary panel, maybe as a generalist, you're teaching lots of subjects, or maybe if you're in the senior panel, you're teaching one subject to many groups of students or one or two subjects that might um, have overlap or that might not. So I'm hoping we'll get to, to um, share some examples of things that you might do that will be relevant across the board. Uh, but I did want to say that if you still have questions or you wanna talk through an idea of how you might use one of our story maps in the classroom, um, please don't hesitate to reach out. I know I can't drop in the chat for all the attendees to see, but you are welcome to email me at Amanda, A-M-A-N-D-A -A -A, at canhist, C-A-N-H-I-S-T dot C-A. Um, and we can just nerd out about some pedagogical applications. <laughs> Jean might want in on those conversations too, but I'd love if you have like, I, something about webinars, it's hard as you leave, right? You, you're here for the hour and you go and you're like, I just want to talk to, there you go. Thanks, Louie. I just want to talk to that person about what I might do in my classroom. So please, I genuinely mean it, uh, reach out and I'd be happy to chat about it. Um, okay, so some ideas for what you might do with story maps that already exist. For example, the ones that Louis was showing uh, or the other ones that exist on our website. Um, and this is keeping in mind that you could have, you know, everyone in the class, for example, could collaboratively focus on one map. So let's talk about the all for nine map, the labor history um, map. For example, you could put students into small groups and they could each engage with one of the moments on the map. So they're sort of like looking at the micro moments while contemplating the fact that everyone is exploring these this macro moment of labor history across Canada. Um, something that I think is really powerful about the story map is how much differentiation is possible. So there, there could be choice, right? Students could choose which one they want to look at. In small groups they could choose, independently they could choose, um, which moment in time they're interested in. Um, and it, it provides a lot of opportunities, I think, to self-pace, right? Students can engage in it by themselves. They can read the paragraph. They can watch the videos. They can jump ahead. They can come back, right? They could do it in order of like chronology, or they can do like things I'm most interested in to things I'm least interested in, right? And we know that giving students choice and voice in the classroom helps a lot in terms of um, just building enthusiasm and engagement and curiosity about what's happening. Um, I also like the opportunity with something like the All for Nine story map to give opportunities for enrichment, right? Or to say, well, if you if you want to go further on this, you're welcome to watch the YouTube videos, but you don't have to. So students could choose to do that, but you could also opt for not having to do that. The multimedia experience might be something that students are doing if they want to take on that extra step, but not necessarily. And being able to have that option is really nice. Um, and also just from our perspective at, at Defining Moments, what something I love about these maps is the opportunity to talk with students about the micro and the macro, because you literally zoom in and out, right? You can look at this wide scale moment. Well, what connects what's happening in Alberta to what happened in Hamilton, to what happened over here? And you can also dig deep into those individual moments. And I could imagine planning, right, lessons, units, you could spend an entire year just going through these moments with the students and digging deep into, okay, well, what was happening during the Winnipeg general strike? Let's look at a map of Winnipeg. Let's find archival images of Winnipeg at the time and go a bit deeper than even the map itself is currently going. Um, and I think that's something that's really exciting, the idea of asking questions of the map. So like, why do you think the person who made this map included what they included, right? You're immediately disrupting this idea that maps arrive to us fully formed, which students often believe, right? Like the map just exists. And I think this idea of disrupting that is very, very important. When I was teaching grade seven, the students were like astounded by this notion that people make the map, right? Who's made it? What was their intention? What was, the, who's the audience? And even if you're talking about us at defining moments, right? But then you can have a wider scale conversation about, well, how does Google make maps? How do they choose to show disputed boundaries between maps? Or like, why did they opt for that scale, that legend, right? Where you start having conversations about uh, 
how a map is curated, right? How the elements of a map are chosen, which is modeling for students eventually, if you want them to make their own, how they might make those choices too. So thinking about those sorts of things, why was this source included? Why did they choose that YouTube video? Can you find another YouTube video that might fit there? Or like, is there a sound that you would have chosen to go with this, right? Really getting students involved in thinking about how are these choices made? Right? How were they curated? And then, and then em emphasizing that they can also be curators and engage in a curatorial thinking practice where they're making sense of things, they're selecting things, right? And they, they're thinking about, well, who would I share this out with? And why would I do that? And if I did, what would I do? Um, and I think that's really exciting across subjects, right? Of course, there's opportunities for geographic thinking. Geography might be an obvious first choice where you might be thinking about, well, I can talk about cartographic conventions, legend, title, scale, those sorts of things. In the digital world, which is where our students usually use maps as opposed to paper maps, although I still have a nostalgia for paper maps <laughs> and I'm excited for students to engage with them. But realistically, there's a technological literacy that we want to support our students in having when they're using a digitized map, right? Where you can speak about conventions, you can speak about map making. Um, but that's also something that's exciting to talk about in other classes, right? Like the idea of audience, right, is, is meaningful in a lot of different subjects, like in English, like in history. There's lots of places where we're talking about, well, who is it for? And who is it maybe not for, but will accidentally interact with it? And how would they know how to read it, right? What is the process of reading and how is it different in a book or in a map? Those sorts of things. Um, I also think there's a lot here for curriculum um, expectations that ask students to draw connections between subjects, between ideas, um, engaging with data visually, right? Interpreting data that they're seeing, um, being able to make connections between a photo, a video, right? A point on a map, sound, where we're having students really engage in this multimodal reading process. Um, and there's so much here that is really supporting our students who maybe are visual thinkers or narrative thinkers because we're showing information to them as a story. And that's just fun. Like it's, it's just more fun. And I think students are often excited to see this sort of thing in their classroom setting um, and being asked to think thematically as well, right? Like there's something that's really lovely about uh, being able to engage in those sorts of conversations with your, with your students. Um, if you are in a history classroom or if you're collaborating with history teachers, there's also a lot of room here for the big six historical thinking concepts, right? So I, identifying like, well, why were these moments historically significant? Or why did the map maker think those moments were significant? Where did they find their primary source evidence? Like, how is YouTube a reliable source? Or how do you know which videos on YouTube are reliable and which are not? Um, which is a media literacy component as well, right? Um, what I love about the story maps and being able to see all of these different micro moments on a larger scale as well is being able to think about similarities and differences and continuity and change over time. So what was happening in 1991, in 1988, right? What's happening in these different moments in time and being able to think about, well, what's changed and what stayed the same and what are the nuances of those things or connecting us across geographies, right? So there's this like map point in Nova Scotia and there's this map point in Manitoba and you're like, oh, they're thinking about similar things. Do they know that at the time? Like, were they influenced by each other? Like being able to have those kinds of conversations. And I think for students being able to see that often helps. It can be really hard for students at any age to imagine what the country looks like. That's what I've found with my students. So having that visual reminder while you're talking about it, I think is really helpful. Um, and of course, in this time of digital teaching, where we have, I taught through the pandemic, which I know is still ongoing, but I am currently not teaching in it. But there was so much online learning that we did that had I been using these sources in my classroom, these story maps, I think the students would have been much more engaged than perhaps a Google Doc right? Or a scan of a map um, would have had them thinking about, I think it would have been a more exciting <laughs> for them. And it, for you as a teacher, also eases the burden of your planning when you can look at this and say, oh, something already exists. And there are lots of Esri story maps out there, um, in addition to the ones that we have. Um, 
But I think that's all very exciting about taking in, learning the information. You're obviously engaging in the content, but beyond the content, there's all these really exciting skill sets. And then in terms of having students create their own, which I think is also really exciting, the possibility that a student might see this. And as soon as you start asking questions, my sense with students is they start to like, they're doing that kind of like digging of like, oh, okay, so that person chose this. I would have chose this. I would have chosen this video. Like, why didn't they pick this picture, right? There's this sense that students immediately have like a desire to have agency in creating something that they think is cool and figuring out how to do it. And I know Jean's going to show us just in a little bit what the back end of that actually looks like. Um, and if you're terrified, don't be. <laughs> Esri is so lovely and they'll support you through an experience like that. If you're like, how could I possibly teach my students how to make something like that? You can. And don't don't even worry about it. Um, but I wanted to give a couple of examples of, of elements of um, learning skills and, and curriculum that I think would come up or that come up for me when I think about making story maps with students. And then a couple of examples of prompts of just things that you might try or like if you're thinking I would love to do this but I don't know what the students would map. First of all I'd encourage you to ask them because I bet they have lots of ideas but I'll share some ideas with you too. Um, My first the first thought I had was that it's just fun. Like I love this idea of bringing joy into our classrooms when we're engaging in content. And I think that this is an example of something that's joyful for students, right? Where they get to tinker, they get to make something. Um, and having our students make things, right? Actually that application stage where they're doing something, there's that problem solving that's involved that there tends to be more buy-in, I think. Um, and it's a, it develops all of these skills, right? They have to select data, they have to find a way to organize that data. Like they're basically engaging in filling out a graphic organizer, right? You can think of a story map like filling in a graphic organizer where they're making these decisions about what should go where, right? Maybe they're thinking about what is significant? Why is it significant? You're immediately thinking about audience, right? Because if you're like, well, significant to who? Who am I making this for? And you could think about something really authentic, right? Like you're creating this, it could just be for their classmates, right? But you could, they could think about it as like, well, I'm gonna make this to use in this setting, right? Or I'll use it. Uh, I'm gonna tell the story of my family's migration to being here where I'm living right now. And I'm gonna show it to my family over the holidays. I'm gonna get their feedback on it, right? And being able to engage in these sorts of authentic moments. Um, and how wonderful that can be for students to take ownership over what it is that they're doing. And of course, you could imagine there's so much choice and you could limit it. You could say like, this is the scope of what we're doing. Everyone's doing this thing. And still within it, students are making all of these micro choices about, well, are you including images? Are you including sound? Um, are you including a video? <clears throat> and doing those things is actually not as complicated as you might <laughs> worry that it is and students I find are always way more tech savvy than I am and if I imagine myself doing something I get scared and then I'm like no this, the kids know <laughs> the students will know um in thinking about audience I also think this is a great experience of like social awareness so thinking about how another person might learn what might be helpful for other people right you can have conversations about differentiation with the students essentially like how would different kinds of people want to interact with this information? How could you support different kinds of audience members who are learning from you? Uh, and then also metacognition, right? Like, how would I learn best if I was engaging with this map? Why, why would I want a photo? I don't just want to see text. Well, why? Well, it helps me to see photos or it piques my interest if I see a photo before I read the text. Um, that, that, pra that practice of reflecting on your own learning can be really valuable here as well. Um, and then students, of course, could engage collaboratively, like you could have multiple students working on one story map and everyone has their own little micro moment, but they're working towards the larger whole. And then you've given them right their own independent tasks, but they still have to find a way for the map itself overall to work well. And then as we were talking about before, like, what sources are they using? Where are they getting the images? Where are they? picking the videos, the sound, being able to identify their sources um, and feeling confident about their sources and, and feeling confident about sharing them out with other people, um, that all of those things are really helpful. And I think if you're in a context where you're teaching uh, across subjects, there's a lot of opportunity here 
for interdisciplinary learning and for for a final project in you know across all the subjects you teach um or for you if you're teaching one single subject for you to connect with another teacher and be like hey why don't we work together for the students to do this or for you if you're in a school setting and i know some people are where you teach one subject and you do not feel that there is an environment of collaboration where you can still take it on yourself to say we're going to work on these skills and it draws on these other subjects even if you know you have to be sneaky about it <laughs> there's still transferable skills um and I think in the digital world that our students are interacting with, they're they're engaging in this kind of information all the time in unsiloed ways. So I think it's helpful for us to be able to support them in that. Okay, it's so it's funny to talk and not hear anyone speak back, but I really appreciate it. I hope you're all like having a tea, having a coffee, that you're warm and cozy. Um, I'm gonna give some examples of some ways I thought about if I had to ask my students what kind of story map to generate themselves, what would I ask them? Um, tell, so often at the beginning of the year, we do like a getting to know you experience with our students, right? Building community by learning a little bit about who's in our room. Um, they could tell a story about themselves by choosing places of significance. Um, maybe they're including photos for each of those places, songs that remind them of those places, um, and then they're teaching other people about who they are. Um, you could do the same thing for family. Um, instead of, for example, if you're using like a family tree situation in your classroom, um, which I think it can be quite limiting, something like a map might expand our capacity to talk about all the diverse kinds of families that exist and all the places that those families might come from. Um, sort of like the insulin map, which I'm glad that we showed it, you can ask students to tell the story of an invention or a discovery or the development of something scientific, um, like the coronavirus vaccines, right? What are the stories of all the people who are working on vaccines at one time? Um, and I think that really helps resist the idea of like the single brilliant scientist working alone in their lonely lab. Um, something like a, a story map, being able to tell all the micro stories, but also the macro story would help students see like, oh, science happens across time like they were working on this for so long or look at all these different people across countries who are contributing and collaborating with one another um and it really helps i think bring the local to the global and then back the global back to the local even in a subject right like science where you might think well what are we going to map um you might map something like court cases relating to treaties, right, and land rights here at, on Turtle Island. Um, you could include Indigenous land names, links to different cases, um, those sorts of things, videos, photos. Um, you could, in an English class, map a novel. So um, a novel like 15 Dogs, for example, by Andre Alexis. I don't know if, if folks have read that. Really good. Very Toronto. It's very very geographically minded. There's lots of references um, to places in the city and you could map, right? What are all the places where the dogs are going? It's a great book if you haven't read it. Um, or like map a character's journey, right? And and I think that there are all kinds of interesting ways that a student might, might take that and run with it. Um, you could map the, you could make a historical map. We love a historical map at defining moments. Mapping something like the development of rights, right? The development of women's rights, or like we've done the rise of labor movements. Um, or you could map one person's life, which we we also have engaged in those sorts of maps where, for example, you could pick an author um, like Gabrielle Roy, who I know we were recently talking about, Louis. Um, and you could map the life of the author, right? And the movements of the author, but also all of the places that they've written about and sort of have this constellation of that person's thinking and their work. Um, of course, more like traditionally geographic maps, like temperature changes, where you're living, uh, migration, population, um, housing, like all of those sorts of things you could, and, and a lot of these maps already exist, but there's something to asking students to, to make them, right? That engages them in the sorts of skills we were talking about earlier. Um, and then something else that I, I attended an excellent presentation this summer at the Canada's History, a national educators meeting, and um, there were teachers talking about working in their local cemeteries with students in the history classroom. And it made me think that students could do a sort of collaborative classroom activity where they're mapping a local cemetery, adding in archival information about the people who are there in their lives, right, and engaging in this sort of really localized practice 
and each student could focus on one person, right? Or students could be in small groups and together they're, they're populating something that at the end, it would be pretty, I think, terrific to, to be able to learn from each other and look at it that way. Um, I think that's it for all of the things I was thinking. So many things. Thank you so much for listening to me ramble on excitedly about what I would do if I was in a classroom. <laughs> Um, and please, again, do reach out if you have questions or you want to talk about an idea that you have or um, how you might use one of our story maps in your classroom. We would love to chat with you about that. I'm going to pass it to Jean now. Wow. Thanks, Amanda and Louis. Um, I think I, I'm as I'm giving my uh, section or presentation, I'm going to have to change some of my language. I love your disrupt the map or disrupt the story. I'm gonna have to see how I can weave that in. Um, you've already seen some amazing story maps and uh, resources and a amazing um, conversation around how GIS can be used to support teaching and learning. Um, it was so nice to, to hear, um, hear that. Uh, part of the session, Amanda. Thanks for, for your enthusiasm too. Um, so as I was introduced at the beginning, my name is Jean Tong and I manage the K-12 education group at Esri Canada. So um, I come from a teaching background, although it's been about 15 years since I've been in my own classroom with uh, littler people. Most of the teaching I do now is with the um, uh, educators and education consultants, and we get to support across the country as uh, Defining Moments Canada does. And I'm I'm just one of a group of people um, that come together to to support educators. And I'm going to just quickly share my screen here. So I uh, I use story maps as my presentation tool, I'm going to say all the time. I often am, don't, don't use, uh, I'm not definite on things, but all the time I will use story maps as my presentation tool. Um, all right. It, it, they're easy to share. And uh, for all the reasons that Amanda was talking about, they can be engaging and interactive and uh, then at the end of a session, you can walk away with the information and links as well. So today we're, or I'm going to be talking about, this is something I've got to change now. So empowering you and your students to create story maps. So I'm going to demonstrate how to create them, but I, I'd rather say I'm going to show you how you can disrupt the story with your students. I'm, I'm totally changing that. Um, learn, and the other part is how do you access the software if you're you know, wanting to create your own or create them with your students. So it will be two websites that I'm talking about. One of them where I'm going to demonstrate the software is arcgis.com. And the other one where, where my group lives, the K-12 group at Esri Canada is our website and that's where that software um, to access software, access support from us, and access our resources in using ArcGIS technology. All right, so first the uh, the tech stuff. So story maps are accessible through a number of types of devices as long as you're connected to the internet. So whether it's a tablet, Chromebook, smartphone, um, it's all responsive to different types of devices. So it will scale to whatever screen it's on. You can actually print story maps. So if students don't have access to the internet, they can still access them. And so I'll just show you with my story map here um, on the three dots, and you would see this on the defining moment story maps too, print preview. And so this puts it into, an interactive PDF, but of course, if you print it, it will um, not be interactive, but you will have all of the content and that to share with your students. 
It's accessible as well um, to work with screen readers. So when you create a story map, and I'll show you when you're adding artifacts, you can add in explanations so screen readers can pick that up. And it also works with uh, translating tools like in I'm in Google Chrome. And when I right click my story map, I can choose I have it set to translate to French, but there's many languages you can choose to have a story map translate on the fly. So I mentioned they can be printed so you can save you can share your story map and i'm going to show you that in the demonstration. You can also use your own story map or another one so again we'll say the all for nine one where you can um, embed it right into d2l or your class blog or if you have another class website, you can take that and this thing the embed code technical words and iframe code you can just copy that plunk that into your site and what that does is it means your your story map is right in your site so students aren't taken away from your site to access that and interact with them all right so um they combined as you've seen different media um you can add text and interactive maps to put that story map together but you're not restricted to having to add any of those things. You can add two, one, three, many different things you can add. So in creating your story map, uh, things you want to think about, I'll have teachers say, well, how much time do we need to create a story map? And that's, you know, really based on the imagination of your students and the research they've done before they sit down at a computer to create their story map. So if they've done the, the research and they've you know collaborated on the text and got the links to the artifacts they want to um, use, which I've done already for the one I'm going to show you today, makes it really easy to cut and paste and drop that into your story map to, to actually build it. So um, as I mentioned, I've already done the research, I've gathered my artifacts, and decided the how I'm going to arrange it in my story map. Now I'm going to put it all together for you and show how um, how easy it is to build a story map. So we have a resource which um, is linked in this presentation. So you'll you'll get a link to that, and it's created for teachers and students um, on how to create a story map. It has text and videos built into it for you. And so we've used it with a grade five class to um, work with them and workshop how to create a story map all the way up to educators. So first thing we need to do is actually sign into ArcGIS.com. So I'm just going to go and sign in here. And if you don't have an account, that's what we're going to talk about next. Once you're signed in, um, there's a waffle or app picker in the top corner here, and that's where you access apps like Story Maps. So once I've done that, I can go, I can see Story Maps have already created, and I'm going to create a new one from scratch. They're simple to build. Um, it's, it's like a block builder, if you've um, heard that term before. And I'm just going to start with my title slide. My work is automatically being saved, which is great. It's not viewable by others. It's private to me unless I choose to share it. I can add an image or video from my device for the title slide. I can choose the uh, focal point of the image that I've added in because it may be on this type of screen. It's not showing the whole image. And it shows me how it looks on different devices and I can add attribution right here and link to the source of my artifact. You know, this is a really important, uh, you know, digital literacy for your students to make sure they're sourcing all of the artifacts they're using. So I'm going to um, continue building my story map by choosing a block to add. So I'm going to start with text. This is where you choose text or media. There are a number of different text options here. Uh, since I've done my research, I'm just pasting in my story. I'm going to continue adding by using this plus button. So now I'm using a um, 
image gallery. I can add up to 12 images here. So these are ones I've already saved in my little research folder. I can you know, choose to delete one, reorder it. And I can always go back and edit this as well. So once I add it into my story map, I can actually change the, the size of the collage. And so it changes the layout as well. I'll continue building the story map by adding more text, this time as a heading. And, uh, and a header in here. We're going to add a video um, as well. And the videos, um, the, it can be a URL or um, on your computer. So I'm going to add actually a link to a YouTube video. And there's always helpful reminders of permission. Do you have permission to use it when you're adding media? So I can also um, add attribution to this. And here I'm going to actually add some alternative text. So screen readers will pick that up. So I want to actually continue my story map on the left hand side so I can actually adjust where my artifacts are in my story and continue adding that. So when you add text, you do get some options to customize it by choosing a different color and you can even put in your own hex code for colors. You can um, italicize text and you can bold it. You can also hyperlink your text as well. All right, adding a map is easy. So there's a few options for you. So if you've made maps already yourself where you've had layers of data, they'll appear here. We're gonna add an express map. It's a really quick way to get some points, lines, areas uh, together into your story. So I'm searching for a place of importance. I can provide information about this location by adding a title, a description, and an uh, image to that. I can change the look of the pin out of the box here and I'm going to click done. Um, so as I mentioned, there's points, lines, polygons, lots of different things you can add. Arrows are a nice way to show movement on a map. Um, whether it's troop movement or as we heard your migrating story, this way I'm just showing movement from Winnipeg and you can symbolize it um, different ways as well. So I can return to continue editing this later or change how it looks on my map as well, just like the images. So uh, here I'm going to add some more alternative text. So it's picked up from a screen reader or as it says here, search engines. There's lots of helpful hints when you're building a story map. So another type of text that I can add is a quote. And um, I can actually customize this quote as well. Like the other text, I'm going to bold bold this here. With each type of block you add, as I mentioned, there's helpful information. So it's a bit of a wizard while you're building it. I'm choosing to embed some live content. So a website that's interactive um, right in my story map. And you can choose how you display it if you want the whole website there or show it as a smaller card. Let's preview the story map. Actually, before we do that, I'm going to show you can rearrange your blocks in here just by clicking and dragging them around, which is nice. You don't have to delete and retype. So now we're going to go preview. And you can choose how it looks on different devices. My students use tablets. I'm going to preview it as a tablet. This is great because you could take a little video to show your students how to interact with the story map. And everything is interactive right inside of this preview. So I can even 
click on the video and it will play inside of here. As is the map, so you can see what the point looks like with the image and that we added. And right through to interacting with the live content. So we chose a website. You could have, you could choose something like a tweet as well. So we're going to close this and go back to um, publish our story map. So by default, it's private. Depending on your settings, you have some options to share it different ways. So I'm just going to publish this privately so only I can see it. And once that do is done, it actually takes you to your published story map. So if you want to continue working on it at this point, you can go to the three dots and choose to edit your story. If you're going to close your computer, take a break and work on it on another day, then uh, when you log in, you go back to your waffle, back to story maps, and you'll see your new story map there. You can uh, click on the options to edit. Duplicate is a nice option here as well, because it, um, it allows you to actually make a copy of your story map and, you know, customize it or edit it for um, students in different classes or with different, um, you know, we have lots of different types of learners in our classroom. So maybe there's different uh, content you want to provide for them or to translate it. All right. So Accessing the software, the support and the resources, it's all through our website. So when you want to create your own story map and save that, you need an account. It's free. It's free for teaching and learning um, for K to 12. So there's no cost to that. You probably already have access to it and you might not know. The support again is offered through our website um, and our resources. And I'll take you there for a quick moment. So I can uh, give you just a little tour. The big thing, signing up for your account and requesting your students' accounts. No personal information is required for students to have accounts. We just need the number from you as the educator that you're requesting. Teaching and learning resources. And as I mentioned, our support uh, through our blog. Uh, we have an email teacher listserv. You can email us, contact us, and easy access to our social media. So your action, uh, the action that I'm putting on you is to be inspired. You can go and explore other story maps that have been created through Defining Moments Canada, through some of our galleries. Request your account and have a try at creating your own story map with some of the examples Amanda shared. And here's a easy link to the tutorial that I referenced at the beginning as well. And I'm going to turn it back over to Amanda and Louie. All right, thank you, Jean. I think it's it's so interesting to hear the different kind of layers to it, the, the storytelling that I spoke about. Not that it's that interesting to hear me speak. It is, but I can't be the one playing. <laughs> Uh, but to, to have the storytelling aspect, the pedagogical aspect, and then to hear kind of how you do create it and how, you know, it's not that hard. There's all these functionalities in it. Uh, I think that's so, so good to, to kind of feature all these things and to see what story maps are, are good for. Um, you know, I know, Amanda, you're saying you're still a, you still like the physical maps. Obviously, I do as well. I've got the maps on my walls and stuff. And I think maps are such an interesting way to learn and it's so exciting to see how the story maps technology that you know Esri is using and developing is allowing us to 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 learn and to teach and to engage in all these different ways so um thank you Esri for for allowing us to have this this opportunity to present with you and I say thank you Esri the organization but also very specifically thank you Jean uh, <laughs> for allowing us to speak with you and and, and to present with you today um, thank you, Amanda, for, for kind of taking on that pedagogical side and, and showing us kind of how the sausage gets made uh, of the, the teaching part of it. Uh, and thank you, everyone who, who showed up. Um, we're going to, obviously, we've recorded the webinar. We're, we'll be posting it on all our channels, so it's always going to be available if you want to come back to it uh, to see anything Amanda or Jean said. Um, probably won't be coming back to see what I've said, but it's going to be there, too. 
so we will be posting it. Uh, we're coming up just on time here. So I think we're just going to end it here uh, and I'll post it and we'll be sending the link and we'll be posting all the link. Um, so thank you, everyone. I don't know, Gina or Amanda, if you have some final words you want to get in. No, I was going to say thank you. Happy GIS Day. There is another session this afternoon, en français, um, uh, that my colleague will be joining Amanda and Louis for. But uh, thank you as well. I, um, you know, going through your website and having multiple meetings uh, with Defying Moments Canada over the years, um, you know, has been good leading up to this point, but hearing the two of you speak today, it's it was really inspiring. So thank you for sharing that. I look forward to our thank partnership you. continuing. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. And to everyone who's here, don't hesitate to reach out if you want to chat more about how to use our story maps in the classroom or you just want to talk about ideas for how to use them in, in general. Thank right. you. Thank you, everyone, and happy GIS Day. Yes, bye.